good morning, Woodland. My name is Pastor Ken Gilmore. I'm the interim teaching pastor here at Woodland, and we are going to be starting a new series this week on the book of Romans. And before we jump into the content of the message this morning, it's one of, you know, the events of yesterday and the violence that we see in our political system, it's one of those things where it'd be easy as a pastor to simply say, well, we have a sermon series plan, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, and we just simply skip over the reality of the world in which we live, but I don't think that that's the job of the church because it's not the job of Jesus. He didn't skip over the difficult conversations and the difficult things, he addressed them. And as a church, even though, yeah, we're gonna talk about Romans today, um, I was at a wedding yesterday, officiated a wedding. We were at the reception when the news came about the shooting that happened in Pennsylvania and the assassination attempt. And it's just one of those things that's just a reminder that we live in a broken world. We live in a fallen world. And as Christians, we are called, yes, to be citizens of a nation, but we belong to another kingdom. And our job is to not simply be like bystanders, we don't simply watch the news, we actually ask God to intervene in our world. And if there's a time that we need to do that, we need to do that now, especially as we head into this season. We are told in the scriptures, as a matter of fact, the book of Romans tells us to pray for those in authority. And, and here's the thing, you know, that, that means we pray for them, that that's part of what we do. Paul didn't get the opportunity to vote on the emperor. Did you know that? He prayed for somebody who did, he didn't get to choose, but he prayed for their authority, for the leadership. We live in a democracy, which creates a unique thing. We get to vote, but as a part of that, we also get to debate and get to argue and to have forceful conversations about the way we think our government should run. What we don't wanna see is that get tipped into violence, to get that, that get tipped into sin. And so as, as followers of Jesus, we have another command that comes out of the book of Romans. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Well, that's going to require God's help and his assistance. So we need to pray for our nation, especially as we go through the next five months. You know, it is going to be a marathon and there are a lot of dangers in this time period. At the same time, we go to a God who wants his kingdom here on earth. He wants us to be agents of his kingdom who live at peace with everyone. And so before we jump into the message, I just wanted to take a moment for us to pray as we should for our nation. So let's do that. Lord, you know this world and you know the violence that we experience, the innocence that is lost due to violence, the sorrow and the pain that comes along with sin. Lord, you know it so well that you sent your son to come and offer his life at the hands of a violent empire so that you could redeem humanity from the sin we find ourselves in. And so, Lord, I pray for our nation. I pray for our nation as we move into this time period where it'd be so easy for us to be divided that that could bleed into your family and your kingdom. And I pray that you would keep us from that. They pray that you would protect those in authority, that you would move in them, that you would be the one who would guide decision-making. Lord, we pray for your presence. And Lord, it is a complicated thing to talk about politics and church and all of this, but it is not complicated to pray the way you taught us to pray. When you said, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. So, it's important that we understand that the study that we're going to do on the book of Romans, the reason that we're doing this isn't just because Romans is in the Bible. I mean, yes, the Bible's important, but when you look at the New Testament, you have the Gospels, right? And right after the Gospels, you have the book of Acts, and that gives us the history of the early church. The very next book that's included is the book of Romans. That's not because it was the first letter that the apostle Paul wrote. 
As a matter of fact, Galatians kind of has the standing of being his first letter. So why does this one get fronted? Well, one, because it's also the longest letter he wrote, but it also contains a summary of the Christian faith. It is a powerful document that has not only informed our faith, it has shaped our faith for 2,000 years. Because documents have that kind of power. You know, we, we just celebrated you know, on July 4th, we just celebrated what? Independence Day, right? And, and did we celebrate Independence Day on July 4th because on July 4th is when we won our independence? No, we declared our independence. We sent a letter to the King of England and basically said, yeah, I know we used to be your colonies, but now we're gonna become states and we're gonna become our own nation. It's such an American thing for us to celebrate the day we just said it as opposed to the day we actually won it but that's the way it is, right? And, and there's power. You get to do that, by the way, if you win, all right? <laughs> Had we lost, that would be a whole different conversation and we'd be drinking a lot more tea. But here's the thing. We as a nation proclaimed something. We said, this is the way it is now. And I can tell you what, 248 years ago, when that document was signed, little did anyone know how it would shape the rest of our history and impact the world in so many ways. Well, you know, Romans is the same thing. That when the apostle Paul was writing this letter in about 57 AD, about 25 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, the apostle Paul is writing this letter to a local church, never knowing that it would become a foundational letter and a part of the New Testament and how the church has been shaped. The power of the book of Romans is significant. We, we actually have our faith in large parts due to the book of Romans. There was, a, there was a, a scholar of rhetoric in Milan, Italy. He was from Northern Africa and he taught Latin, he taught rhetoric, he taught speech and argumentation. And he lived in Milan and even though he was raised in a Christian home, his mother was a Christian, this is around like 380 AD, all right? So this is just after the Roman Empire acknowledged the existence of Christianity and made it legal for you to be a Christian. He rejected his Christian faith. He rejected his upbringing. And he lived a life of rebellion. And even though he was esteemed as a scholar and even though he had status and reputation, he also knew his moral life was a wreck. He fathered a child out of a wedlock when he was 18, lost the relationship with the, with the mother of that child, and was currently at the time when he, when he experienced something I'm gonna share in a second, he was living with a woman who wasn't his wife. And he was heartbroken. And he realized that his morals were off track and he did not know how to get back on track. And so he cried out to God while he sat in the courtyard of one of his friend's houses. And he writes that when he cried out to God, he heard the voice of some children and they were saying in Latin, tole lege, tole lege, which means take up and read. And so what he did is he grabbed the first scroll he could find, a scroll that his friend had just finished reading and he opened it up and these are the words he saw first not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. What he read was Romans chapter 13, verses 13b through 14 that that's where his eyes fell. His eyes fell at a description of where he felt his life already was. And in that moment, God spoke to him. God challenged him. And he would later write about that event and say, I neither wish nor needed to read further. At once, with the, with the last words of this sentence, it was as if a light of relief from all anxiety flooded into my heart. All the shadows of doubt were dispelled. In just reading a few verses out of the book of Romans, reshaped the entire life of a man we know as Saint Augustine. 
a man who would go on and write theology, a man who would go on and shape the thought and teaching of the church for the next 1,500 years. I mean, it is astounding to think how the book of Romans impacted his life and that had a trickle-down effect on the rest of the church. St. Augustine in his confessions would also write, thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. That we are created with this God-shaped void and we try to fill it with all sorts of things that can never fully satisfy until our hearts find rest in God. Well, you fast forward about 1,200 years and there was an Augustinian monk, a man who trained under the teachings of St. Augustine and he lived in Germany and he was struggling, even though he was a professor, even though he's a monk and was a devout person, he also struggled with this concept that how was he, a person who was sinful, supposed to relate to a righteous God? And this is what he writes. He says, I labored diligently and anxiously as to how to understand Paul's words. He's commenting on the book of Romans. The expression, the righteousness of God, blocked the way because I took it to mean that righteousness whereby God is righteous and deals righteously in punishment of the unrighteous. Although an impeachable monk, I stood before God as a sinner. Therefore, I did not love a righteous and angry God, but rather hated and murmured against him. Then I grasped that the righteousness of God is that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy, God justifies us by faith. Thereupon, I felt myself to to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. I broke through. And as I had formerly hated the expression, the righteousness of God, I now began to regard it as my dearest and most comforting word. The man who wrote these words is a man named Martin Luther. And he would launch a reformation within the church that would focus the idea that we are saved not by works, but by faith alone. That this is not a faith we earn. It is a salvation we receive by faith. The impact of Martin Luther cannot be understated as it would shape Protestant church and even really shape the Catholic church in kind of correspondence for the next hundreds of years. And it was because of the book of Romans where he saw that we are given faith and faith alone is what saves. Well, here's the thing, a couple hundred years after the life of Martin Luther, there was a, there was a, Anglican priest who was a missionary actually here in the colonies before we broke away, who was a missionary in Georgia. And although he was a missionary and although he proclaimed the gospel, he also struggled with his relationship with God. Never feeling worthy, never feeling good enough, really questioning, do I really believe this? Well, his missionary journey ended in scandal and he ran back off to England And while he was there, he wrestled with his faith. And a friend seeing him wrestling invited him to a Bible study, which he did not want to go to. (laughs) He didn't want to study it. He didn't want to dig into it. But he went. And that study was on the book of Romans. And they were actually reading Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. And this is what this young Anglican priest discovered. It says about a quarter before nine, while the reader was describing the change wherein God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given, given that he had taken my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. This is a moment that we know of in our tradition, the Wesleyan tradition, as the Aldersgate moment because it happened on Aldersgate Street. And it reshaped John Wesley's life. So much so that he would start a reformation in England 
that would carry on and become known as the Methodist movement, which we are a part of as the Wesleyan church. So what happened to him happened because of the book of Romans. When we think about the impact of Paul's words on on Christianity, you cannot get away from it. And so what we're going to do is, is we're going to spend seven weeks in the book of Romans. We're going to see what is Paul trying to say. Now, this is one letter. Very often, when somebody would send a letter, and and Paul even says it, he handed this to a woman, had her take it to Rome, and it was the job of the person delivering the letter to read it. And they would read the whole letter in one sitting. We never do that. But we are going to take seven weeks, and we're going to un- pack the book of Romans. And here's the thing. We don't want to just simply be talking about it on Sundays. We want you engaged in the process as well. And so what we have is is we have a seven week that we're going to go over, but we also have a way for you to connect by a daily application, a daily reading of the scriptures. And so we have this thing called the Romans Road. It's a texting group. All you have to do is text STUDY in capital letters to 269-399-3080 or you can scan the code and connect that way. But what we're going to do is is we're going to send you a daily reminder to read because we want you to read with us in Romans. We want you to understand the letter and all it has to say. We are only gonna be able to touch parts of it as we go through it in seven weeks, but we want you to be able to read it all. And so we encourage you to sign up for this and, and follow us along. And if you miss a Sunday, because guess what, it's summer, and people go on vacation and you're gonna miss a Sunday here or there, we have these messages online. I would encourage you, make sure you watch. Because Paul wrote an entire letter and I don't want you to just get part of it. I want you to see all of it. And so we encourage you to be involved in that. And the main emphasis of Paul's letter is what he calls the good news, the gospel. That is at the heart of what Paul is trying to explain because he says in Romans chapter one, verse 16, during his introduction, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now, when we hear the word gospel, especially nowadays, you hear the, the word gospel, you automatically think a religious context. We do. We, we, we simply, we hear gospel and we think gospel music. We think the gospel message. And so it has religious overtones to us. Did you know when Paul wrote this letter, it had none of that. It was simply a word that was found in Greek, euangelioi, which meant good herald. And most often it was used in a war situation, in a battle situation, where people would bring news from the front line to the emperor or to the people who were in charge of the battle because they weren't on the front lines. And so the good herald would bring good news of the front. Now, they weren't saying, this is what we think is going to happen. They would bring news of something that has already happened. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about, and it's an important distinction. Because he's not talking about what might be, what we hope will be. He is saying, no, I've got some good news. We have a good herald called the gospel that brings us news of something already done. So why did Paul write this book? Why is he writing to Rome anyway? Because he didn't start this church. We find out that he's writing to this church because he's planning to visit on his way to Spain. Because for Paul, his mission was to reach the entire Gentile world and Spain was the furthest you could go in the world he knew. So he was going to the ends of the earth. That was his plan. But he's gonna stop in Rome along the way. So he introduces himself. Hey, this is who I am and this is what I teach. But he also is addressing another issue because in the decade leading up, this church was started, it was started with Jews and Gentiles. But Emperor Claudius came along at one point and expelled all the Jews from Rome. 
So we don't want you in Rome at all. So they were forced to leave all the Jews. That included Jewish Christians. They were expelled from Rome. And for five years, the church was Gentile only. Well, after that five-year period, the Jews were finally given permission to re-enter Rome. And so these Jewish Christians came back to Rome and tried to reintegrate to a church that had forgotten about them. And they didn't have the same customs. And suddenly church was a lot different than it had been five years previously. And what began to happen is is there was tension in the church and the church was starting to break up into a Gentile and a Jewish camp. And the apostle Paul is writing to say, this cannot happen that we belong together, we are one in Christ. And it's part of the message that he's bringing. And as part of saying this is how we're one in Christ, he starts with the good news. As a matter of fact, you can hear it in his words in Romans 1.16, verse I just read. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Like he's telling these Gentiles, hey, don't forget where this started, that we worship a Jewish Messiah, that it was through Abraham and his descendants that God was going to reconcile the world through Christ. So let's not simply assume that because they weren't popular in Rome, they don't belong in the church, no. No, Paul's gonna address it and say, no, we are grateful that God used the Jewish nation to bring about his plan for salvation. But Paul continues his discussion. And in talking about not only is salvation available to Jews and Gentiles, the reason salvation is available to Jews and Gentiles is because we all have the same problem. And one of the ways that Paul talks about the problem that we have is found in this verse where he writes, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Like, Paul's like, hey, I I need to tell you something. The wrath of God is on the move right now. I don't know about you, but I don't don't like God's wrath. I don't know about you. Are are you a person that likes God's wrath? I know I'm a person, person who prays for God's wrath on certain people, but I don't like it. I don't want it ever to come towards me. I like God's forgiveness. I like God's mercy. I like God's love. But Paul's like, no, no, we got a problem and that's God's wrath. That we have to acknowledge an uncomfortable truth. That God's wrath is being revealed. That that it's ongoing, that there's a problem. Now, thankfully, the apostle Paul also tells us why. This is what we read. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, They neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. He's talking about idolatry. Now, Before we begin to just be like, oh, those poor savage human beings who worshiped idols. Um, Before we start pointing fingers at them, let's remember, even though we're way more sophisticated and way more scientific and way more educated, uh, we still have idols, don't we? In fact, we, we have idols so much, we have a show on TV called American Idol. I mean, it's a, we, we have our idols. This, this is our culture. We idolize the bottom line of our bank account. We idolize our political ideologies. We idolize our status and our importance. We idolize the likes on social media. There are things that we worship that are not God. And God 
God's wrath is being revealed because of two things. The Apostle Paul identifies them. He identifies them as godlessness and wickedness. Now, when Jesus was asked about what is the greatest commandment, how did he respond? What was his response to the people? He said to love God and love others. You wanna know what it is? You wanna know what the greatest commandment is? Love God and love others. And when Paul identifies godlessness and wickedness, what he's identifying is our big problem. Because as human beings, we disrespect God, we disrespect him, and we, we desecrate others. We disregard God. We don't allow God to be God. We put other things in place of God. We pursue other things as more valuable than God. And there's a corollary that happens when we do that. That when we don't love God, we cannot love those created in his image. So what do we do? We treat them wickedly. We desecrate them. The reason I use the word desecrate is because what desecrate means is to de sacred them, that we take away their sacredness as another human being created in the image of the Father, and we simply treat them as lesser. And that's a problem. That is godlessness and wickedness. And what happens? God's wrath is revealed when those are on the move. Now, here's the amazing thing, because when I think about God's wrath, I don't know about you, but growing up and reading the Bible and hearing sermons and things like that, when I think about God's wrath, I think about punishment. I think about judgment. I think about an angel army at the day of judgment. It's not a pretty, I, pretty concept. But here's the thing. The Apostle Paul explains what God's wrath looks like in his context, because this is what he says. God judges us by giving us what we want that God's wrath is revealed simply by giving us what we already desire. This is what we read in Romans 1.24. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. What did God do? God stepped back, said, if this is what you want, you want to replace me with that? Go for it. I'm allowing it. I'm gonna give you space to do that. You wanna worship that? You go ahead and worship that. That God's wrath isn't revealed by armies from heaven marching down. God's just like, no, there's going to be a consequence when you do not honor me, when you desecrate others. The word sinful desire that the apostle Paul uses here isn't even like bad desires. The way he describes it, he uses a word that means over desire. That, that it's essentially there are good desires and when they are indulged and they're over desires, they become disordered desires. Tim Keller in writing about this in Romans 1, 7 for you, he writes these words. He says, the main problem of our heart is not so much desires for bad things, but our over desires for good things. Our turning of created good things into gods of our worship in our service. The way I put this down was we need to be careful not to allow good things to become God things in our lives. That we have to be very careful to not allow these good things to become God things to us. Because our heart moves in that direction. It's the way that we are pulled in our human nature. And here's the thing. If you allow a good thing to become a God thing, God doesn't stop you. As a matter of fact, in the, next, in the next eight verses, the apostle Paul writes that God gave them over three times. Three times in, in this passage, he's going to talk about God gave them over and listen to what God gives them over to. It says, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind. So they do what, they ought, what ought not to be done. And then he starts to list the ways they do things that ought not to be done. And I want you to listen to this list and see if, you, if your particular sin might get mentioned. 
They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve, deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Anybody else get uncomfortable reading that verse? Anybody else find yourself on that list? Anybody ever disobey their parents? Don't raise your hands. Some of you may have done it this week, right? We've, we are on this list. This list isn't a group of people that we shake our finger at. This is us. And this is the problem because God's giving us over to those things that he's stepping back and saying, listen, that's not the way to go. You desire it, okay. There's gonna be some consequence. But that's not where he stops. He says, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? See, here's what's really important. Here's, here's the thing that we need to know. God's wrath doesn't lead us to repentance. Did you notice that? It is his kindness that leads us to repentance. It is our knowledge that we are deserving of wrath and yet God is patient. God, God shows forbearance and God draws us, not by his judgment, but by his kindness, his willingness. He leads us to repentance with kindness. Do you know that that's God's disposition towards you? He will allow you to do the things where you worship other things than him but he's always offering you a kindness. There is a kindness to say, come back, there's a better way. And Paul lists all these different sins. And I, the way Paul lists things, I always love it because when you see Paul listing sins, he never makes it a complete list. Because even in this list, he's like, I'm gonna show all these sins, I'm gonna write them all, but I'm even gonna create a category that even if I make an entire list, you'll create new sins and I'll have to update my list because we are creatively sinful. It's what we are. And he says, the problem is, it's not just them, it's all of us. And we get to one of the most familiar verses in all of the book of Romans, one that I heard growing up quite a bit, Romans 3.20. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin, that through the law we become conscious of sin. Let me ask you a question, another moment of confession here today. When do you care what the speed limit is when you're driving your car? When do you care what the speed limit is? There are, I've actually thought about this, there's two times. One time is when someone's driving faster than you and you're like, where are the cops? When somebody's driving this reckless. The other time is when there's a cop behind you. Then all of a sudden it's like, what's the speed limit and how quickly can I get under it? Because the law makes us conscious of sin. It's knowing the law that reminds us, ah, I've got a problem. I've got this tendency to break the law. Because if it weren't for the law, do you know what would happen? You would simply suffer the consequence for sin. There's a reason there's a speed limit because if you exceed the speed limit often enough, there are bad consequences coming to you. There's a consequence for breaking laws. That's why they're there. And they make us aware of the consequence before we even break it. Otherwise, the only way we know is when it's broken and it breaks us. 
And in this category, here's what Paul says, and I love this. He says, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Ever hear that verse before? It's a popular one. It's part of the Romans road where, we probably, where, where Christians try to say, hey, this is our problem. These are the, this is the way that we need to understand the way we operate and the way we relate to God. All of us fall short. All of us fall short of the glory of God because all of us have sinned. But here's the thing. That's the bad news of the good news. And we gotta be aware of the bad news of the good news. It's what makes the good news good news. It's because it's overcoming a bad news situation. And the bad news is we all fall short. But that verse that we very often hear pulled out of its other verses is surrounded by some important words that you need to hear this morning. Because in Romans 3, 21 through 24, where you find those words, it also says this, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. That, yes, all of us fall short, but here's the good news. God's already provided a way for us to be righteous, even if we're Jews and had a law we don't follow, and Gentiles who weren't given the law and don't follow. That there is a righteousness that can be ours through Jesus Christ by faith. Now we're going to talk more about the good news next Sunday, all right? And for some of you are like, well, I should have just come next Sunday. But no, there's some bad news we have to grapple with first. And here's the thing, as, as people, we tend to want to hear the good news without ever apprehending the bad news. But I'm going to ask you to do something difficult this week. Because the reality is, all of us struggle with honoring God. All of us struggle with treating those created in God's image the way we should. And so I wanna ask you to wrestle with a question this week. Where are you experiencing the wrath of God giving you what you want? Because all of us experience this in little ways. For some of us, it's big ways. But where are we experiencing the wrath of God? Not because God's putting his thumb on us, but because God stepped back and say, there you go. I've given you free will. You you can make these choices. But do you understand and do you apprehend the consequences? And for some of us this week, we need to wrestle with that because the good news is going to become greater news if we understand what God's saving us from. So I'm going to ask you to do some hard work this week as you read Romans. We're going to go through these verses again as you read this week. And as you read them, I want you to say, okay, so where am I here? Where am I experiencing God's wrath simply because of the things I want that he's allowing me to have? And next week we'll talk about what we can do about that heart and about those desires. Let's pray. Lord, your kindness is what leads us to repentance. It leads to a change of heart, a change of direction. And Lord, for some of us, for some of us, we are fearful of your wrath but it's because we don't understand your kind offer. So Lord, as we go through the book of Romans, I pray one that you would help us to truly understand the ways that we harm others, the way that we dishonor you, that that we would take ownership of the things that are revealing your wrath. But Lord, help us to remember that not only do you point out the bad news of the good news, but in your kindness, you give us good news that something has been done in human history that makes all the difference for all of us. So give us wisdom to know what we need to do with what we've heard. Give us the courage to do something about it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.